Welcome to Strategic News International, Dr. Vida Nage. Uh, you are the director of the Bandaranai K Center for uh, International Studies in Colombo. And uh, we wanted to talk to you about the recent uh, terror attacks in Sri Lanka. Very tragic uh, happening indeed, and uh, a lot of turmoil, in fact, in your country. Uh, how do you see these terror attacks in Sri Lanka? What impact will they have? on your country yeah the, the thank you for having me on your show uh, the, the the terror the terror attacks will have uh, multiple impacts on the sri lankan society in general because mm -hmm. um, you know it has shaken sri lanka out of a slumber that it was in in the last 10 years in in many ways and many forms so uh, so in, at 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 one extreme, it's a national security challenge. Some people call it a national security crisis. And then it's, got, it's kind of rapidly pushing uh, policymakers to rethink whatever the measures, the strategic thinking behind the, the, the national security uh, modus operandi of the last 10 years since the defeat of the Tamil Tigers. Yeah. And also it's pushing, it's politically challenging the leadership of the country to, to, to fix the political narrative in the country as well as prevent it sliding into a, a, a kind of a fictitious uh, situation where you would, mm -hmm. the, the ultimate crisis would be a clash between the majority Sinhalese and, 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 and the Muslims yes. uh, uh, because the Sinhalese, I mean, the, the Sinhalese are predominantly Buddhist, but I think there has been tensions running high. Not, I mean, because of the of, of identity politics of the last five years. So there has been certain sentiments. There have been certain hard sentiments towards each other in both communities. So was the Sri Lankan government uh, caught napping not only in terms of these multiple terror attacks that took place, but also because perhaps they didn't read the tensions between, say, the Sinhalese. <clears throat> and the, the minority Muslim community in Sri Lanka correctly? Um, I, well, I don't think they didn't read it correctly because there were manifestations last year's Digana incident uh, and there were incidents where yes. uh, hardline Muslim radi radicals were found, you know, defacing uh, Buddhist statues. So, mm -hmm. and, and there was, of course, uh, right-wing Sinhala Buddhist movements which have been... So, the, the, the signs were already there, but I think what they didn't see was the transformation of these tensions into an uh, actual scenario. They didn't see the catalyst coming up. They didn't see a point where everything will be blown open, right? Because these tensions could run, there could be certain limited riots, but it could not affect the country per se. But what the Easter attacks did was put it out in the open, to blow it open in a way that actually is yet to be controlled politically by the state. Of course, the security situation is pretty much under under control thanks to the hard work of the Sri Lankan security forces who has always been training, has been ready for, 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 for disasters and crises. But I don't mm -hmm. think the political system was ready yes. for something like this. So was it largely to do, uh, to do, to do with the fact that uh, you see, there has been a rift between your president and your prime minister. And so perhaps this contributed to this, uh, you know, intelligence which was provided, say, by India and some other countries on a possible terror strike in Sri Lanka. So do you think well, that this information slipped between the fingers? In a way, yes, it's, it's the obvious answer. But I think it's, there are two things there, right? The two yeah. things are one, is the tension, the, the, the current tension with, between the executive presidency and the government, I mean, the, the prime minister and the, and, the, and, the, and the president. And also, the second is the larger crisis of how the political establishment per se has failed to understand the evolving security challenges of the region, of the world, as well as how it is affecting Sri Lanka. So even, even in a situation, say, both these, you know, the president and prime minister was in harmony, if... Uh, even I still feel if this intelligence would have been not been taken seriously because none of them conceived an attack of this scale. It's the problem is because I don't think the national security vision or the strategic thinking was in sync with what was happening 
in, in, in globally in the case of ISIS or, or in the case of uh, violent extremism because the focus was pretty much more on geopolitical security lines where you had this you know the Indian notion was the big focus the security the strategic thinking yeah. was predominantly right. Indian notion and maritime security and so on but in a way they, in, in, in that case they missed this particular thing spoken about it i think you see that how much of uh, like the big powers india and china in the indian ocean region also there i think their battle for influence within sri lanka itself so do you think that, that this kind of diverted the attention of the sri lankan government to to this these these issues rather than what was going on back home or within within sri lanka yeah, I mean, look, look, the, the security, if you look at the military intelligence in Sri Lanka, they have been providing constant signals of tensions between Tamil and Muslim communities in the northern east. They have been telling the, you know, the authorities about the rising, you know, radical, you know, emergence of non-state radical groupings such as this, such as this Islamic grouping. So it's, it's not that it was not known. It's a fact that, but what became the priority of the state mm -hmm. in the context of national security was pretty much dictated by the big power rivalry. And in a way, I think we got a little bit carried on with it. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so, so because, because, because the rivalry is very, pretty much there. Even I have been talking about it. the big yes. power rivalry is very serious. It's pretty obvious. It's pretty much there. I think so that kind of, because that is why I feel ISIS was so strategic to understand this, this open, this, this kind of niche in Sri Lanka. You know, because, you know, for Baghdadi to suddenly emerge and talk about it now and, of yes. course, uh, citing the defeat in Syria. And they, it's like they have, re, they, have re, they have found a new kind of, you know, space where they could kind of manifest like this. So that's my major concern, actually. Yes. Uh, now, the ISIS has claimed responsibility and you said Baghdadi came out with this video yesterday saying that this was kind of uh, revenge for what has happened in Syria and in Baghuz. But uh, do you think that there is really a link between ISIS and the National Tawhid Jamaat whose, uh, whose members carried out the terror attacks in Sri Lanka? Well, well see, see, the eight members of the, of, of the terror group, I mean, Sri yes. Lanka will have, will have in Sri Lankan Muslim uh, radicals, there may be radicals, there may be extremists, but to, to, to become a suicide bomber, that is a bit of a higher step. So I don't think any of these guys were just, I mean, they, they, they were just in Sri Lanka. I, I, have, I have a strong, uh, you know, fear and a strong suspicion that all of them would have fought somewhere in ICL battlegrounds. They, they are battle hardened. Yes. They are pretty much indoctrinated so because ISIS, you know, the trademark is ISIS teachers indoctrinates you and also make you very violent, teachers you all the battles and then put you, in, put you into the battleground. So people who have had that experience has that kind of ability to become a suicide bomber, not a just a free radical, a radical who is just, you know, even, you know, a mili radical militant won't kill himself. So that's the difference. So I feel that link would have been made through these people who would have gone as foreign fighters to the, the to, to ISIL battle theatres and have played a major role, or at least some role in those battles and would have come back in the last couple of years. Yeah, that, that, yeah there have been reports of, yeah, sorry, there have been reports of Sri Lankans who have gone and joined the ISIS and then returned to Sri Lanka. Perhaps uh, the Sri Lankan yeah. government could have keep, kept a close a watch on, on their activities. That's, 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 their yeah, so the, that's where the critique of the intelligence failures, not just the intelligence failures, but not the, 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 the political failures to kind of listen to the intelligence community. I think there is a, there is a good, there's a significant gulf between the political and the intelligence communities, which is, I think, which needs to be highlighted. If not, we start, people try to blame the intelligence as per se, but I don't think that's, that's the case. Yeah, you, you had the sackings, for instance, you know, you had uh, your police chief being sacked and uh, yeah, yeah. intelligence chief also, you know, there's been a crackdown. But uh, I think, as you rightly said, uh, the problem lies elsewhere or it's perhaps much more deeper than just and your... Kind of the superficial ones, yes. Yeah. Now, you see the Sri Lankan government, for instance, now as part of its security measures has said that no whales are going to be allowed. What do you think about do you think it's a judgment and do you think it will actually help in having better security checks in place? Well, I think 
I think the 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 thing in Sri Lanka is Sri Lankans when during the last conflict, there was a people felt safe when they saw significant military presence. So this is kind of passive security that Sri Lankans are pretty used to, right? We, okay. If you were if you were you know living in that time growing up or you know your times, you remember you know. people were not always complaining about the passive security measures checkpoints you know you know you know random checks those are all part of passive security but the problem is we are living mm-hmm. in a different time, day and age when sri lanka wants to be a, a hub for tourism a hub for yeah. investment so passive security presence and what it symbolizes is not great for those ambitions a state which mm-hmm. is safe is it is safe secured through through invincible measures of 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 more advanced uh, stable surveillance and rather mm-hmm. than those pretty much out there so i think we need to in the future strike a balance or acquire technology techniques uh, skill sets where we have more far superior better ways of doing surveillance doing checks uh especially when it comes to border control entry points we, we still we lack a lot of the technologies as well as a skill set so that's kind of a major major disadvantage we have had you know in, in the process mm-hmm. and uh, what is the mood like in colombo right now uh, it's been uh, a little over a week since the attacks yeah. uh, we've had journalist colleagues indian journalist colleagues who had been to colombo and re- returned to said that the the tensions are still running high and uh, uh, the muslim community obviously feels that it's under siege so um do you see any anything tensions reducing yeah. the, the, there the are two things there are two things it's happening which is which is kind of not helping at all one mm-hmm. is you know we remembering my life you know living in sri lanka during the, the, the past conflict yes. there's to be a massive spike in the fear factor it's kind of for me it's 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 very strange but you know there, there seems to be suddenly an existential fear of of mm-hmm. existential fear that is like you know it's very chilling and you know, people seem to be really scared and really so that kind of siege fear mentality it's it's a bit strange remembering we had this kind of you know we had say in security issues so the the bomb the, the bombers have in a way kind of been successful in creating this kind of mentality among sri lankans who are have been you know more naturally resilient and who have been more responsive because we had a 30 year conflict but for me in colombo it's very it's very surprising it's very people are really scared people are really worried that's number one the number two is the small factor about how the mainstream media every day has huge segments like in india i suppose on the whole security situation and there is always yes. for highlighting of facts about finding of knives swords in 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 in, in mosques yes. so mm-hmm. In, if, if i was a muslim in sri lanka in colombo i would be very worried because there seems to be a sustained narrative of a kind of a islamic conspiracy you know yes, conspiracy. yes. so that, that is not helping because uh, i mean so those two feed into each other you have a muslim community who's actually the muslim community is pretty worried but mm-hmm. of course they are also worried and they are also kind of voiceless because they feel you know you know these guys carried this out and there is some kind of you know, i see some of muslims you know saying i'm sorry and you know you know putting things on social media apologizing for things they have never done but it's like the sentiment so the fear among the people and this i don't i think that's a toxic mix if we don't kind of rectify that it's not a great i mean i don't see any you know uh, riot breaking out but it's going to be very uneasy relations for at least for a short time to come in this country Yeah so uh, what role do you think the government can play in building bridges between communities in Sri Lanka during these times of tensions Yeah if the government succeeds in building bridges among themselves first they might succeed in building yes, very uh, true. Uh, building uh, <laughs> still trying to four points over each other after the terror yeah. attacks so both the there's still a uh, lot of political you know, you know you know yes so right and left and right so so uh, yes. probably they need to come to terms with them with themselves that this is this is a this is a bigger problem than themselves 
it's not about people it's not about individual it's not about uh, who's running who's who's in in the who's the president or the prime minister who's going to be the president it's much bigger than all of it. We, it it's going to be a major national catastrophe if we don't fix it because sri lanka is a very simple open and free society so open and free societies which are which are not strongly governed are the most vulnerable for violent extremism so that's right. so they, they really they really should understand that and you know you know you know you know work faster and 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 firmer and and probably in a more more, more uh, consolidated manner rather than this haphazard responses they are giving uh dr vedana gave one final question uh you see india is a is a is a close neighbor and a close friend of sri lanka do you see india playing any kind of role in in post these terror strikes in terms of say intelligence sharing or outreach to the communities or say reining in the radical elements i think india will be a key player a key factor in 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 in, in anything the government does in the future especially to do with this crisis because you know given the diversity in india given all the challenges india has faced india has successfully managed to keep isis away there has yes. been i mean there is no there has been no major isis i still related attack in india that's right even the recent problem was totally different what happened in uh, with uh, uh, jaish e mohammed that was totally different from this so so if india has been successful i think one of the part success of india's part success of india is the the, the intelligence mechanisms how uh, the intelligence communities work with the security establishment how political decisions are made so i think uh, india i think should sustain in providing that uh, information intelligence because i think that's some at least till we get things right i think we are very, we are very much dependent on the, uh, the the intelligence that is shared by mainly by india so and i, I think uh, india and we should also be kind of exposed to how india has managed to keep given the vast muslim community india has within itself and the vast diversity how it has managed to sustain and contain uh, not just by secure you know but just by force by politically how they have, i think these are all experiences that sri lanka needs to you know india to share with and 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 and, and i think sri lanka needs india more than ever before especially given this particular situation whether you like it or not yeah yeah so many lessons for sri lanka to learn from india, india i suppose yes. yes yeah thank you for talking to us dr vedan age it was a pleasure having you with us on strategic thank news thank you so much thanks for having me on your program thank you